trying to understand the the brain as it is a fully formed thing is is somewhat of a, a very incomplete picture because it grew that way and the plan for which it grew that way also grew that way over a much longer time frame. And so those are really important constraints in my mind for how we understand it as a whole. You know, I like the fact that I'm fitting RNNs to biological data, but I don't actually believe that, you know, the brain is making, you know, little analog continuous signals or not. They're making actual spikes with all of this rich biophysics underneath it. I worry sometimes that our classic ideas about, about neural network training are missing a lot of really cool stuff that biology can do that, that you know, may implement totally different kinds of learning roles that operate on much lower time scales or that change excitability in interesting ways. This is Brain Inspired. Hello, it's Paul, and this is the second panel discussion about the topics at Neuromatch Academy 2021. Today, we're talking about the scientific experiences and perspectives about dynamical systems, um, coming on the heels of the lectures and tutorials on linear systems, real neurons, and dynamic networks. With me today is Adrian Fairhall at the University of Washington, Seattle, Bing Brunton also at the University of Washington, Seattle and our old friend Kanaka Rajan at Mount Sinai in New York. And you'll learn more about them in a moment. Among other things, we all agree that talk of doctrines should be banished from neuroscience. It's the only part of the show where we're all passionately talking over each other for 10 seconds or so. I link to their labs and information in the show notes at braininspired.co slash podcast slash NMA dash two. Enjoy. I thought maybe what we could do is go around and you guys could each introduce yourself, say what you do, um, you know, very high level. But I thought maybe it'd be fun to <laughs> to ask you. So if you ask a, uh, a musician what his or her favorite uh, work is, it's never the same as what is their most popular work, what they're, they're what they're best known for. So I thought, in addition to telling to talking about something that uh, th- talking about what you do you could reveal something that you feel most proud of that might be, maybe it is the expected thing that you might be most proud of, but what do you consider uh, your best idea or uh, body of work or feat or event, et cetera? Adrian, perhaps we could just start with you. So go for it. Sure. So I'm Adrian Fairhall. I'm a professor at the University of Washington. And my background is in in physics. So I came through... um, statistical physics and was really inspired to get into uh, neuroscience via working on dynamical systems. I started out in plasma physics, actually, and then went to turbulence and then uh, only started neuroscience in my my postdoc years. So I I am a computational neuroscientist, so I do work on many different systems. And I think uh, the way I like to think about the common theme of our work is really uh, very central to this topic, which is trying to apply dynamical systems ideas to understand coding. You know, we sort of came into neuroscience thinking about, uh, you know, about neurons as encoding information. And from the beginning, I've always been very interested in how uh, the, the picture that we have of neuronal representation really arises from the fact that neurons are physical systems that, that undergo, you know, transformations that are governed by dynamics. So my, I guess the, the piece of work that I I love maybe most. <laughs> I, I did, I've done a lot of work on adaptive coding, and I, I really mm-hmm. um, am fond of that too. But the, um, I really particularly love this um, way that we were able to describe the dynamics of, of single neurons uh, that, that have these sort of long timescales of adaptation. And when I saw that happening in the fly visual system, you know, in collaboration with Bill Bialik, um, we realized that that might be able to be described as fractional differentiation. And so, and that turned out to, to really be a very good model. So the way that um, the neural firing rate uh, transforms the envelope of a time varying, you know, noise stimulus matches very well with the idea that it's taking a fractional derivative of that, of that noise envelope. 
And that that matches really well and explains a lot of kind of weird looking behavior in the fly visual system. And then also turns out to be not a bad model for, for cortical neurons. So I, I love that. And I think it's a really kind of unexpected finding that's the, you know, the weirdly sort of trans, transferred from one system to another. I should have added what, what I should make you guys also say is what you think other people would guess that you would say that you're most proud of. Do you have an answer for that, Adrian? Uh, it's probably our nature paper, you know, 2001, which is a paper I really still love too, right? And where we showed um, this very neat um, adaptation of, of um, a neural input output curve to the um, standard deviation of, of the input and that your know, neurons are able to sort of dynamically adapt their their dynamic range to sort of almost instantaneously match the dynamic range of the input. So they're doing sort of efficient coding, but but continuously and on the fly. So I, that I think it's my yeah, okay. <laughs> it's got to be the high profile. Oh, so they will know, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Great, thank you, uh, Bing. Maybe should we we should move on to you. What do you um, what are you do you are you most proud of? When what do you do? And what would other people say is your best known or or best work let's say yeah paul so i've been i've been thinking about that um so 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 like adrian um i'm a computational neuroscientist at the university of washington but i think i arrived at doing kind of similar type work in dynamical system but from a pretty different path um i started out as a biology major as an undergraduate and uh, i did it in part because i knew i loved biology but it also meant that i could take as much physics and math as i wanted um, and, mm. uh, and that was where I actually got to dynamical systems. So I took um, my first dynamical systems class with, with Jerry Marsden, and it totally changed my entire life. From then on, I realized that this was basically everything that I actually cared about um, because life is, is the study of things that change, and a dynamical system is the mathematics of things that change. And so I wanted to do that. Um, and at, up until that time, I had been, my research had mostly been in molecular biophysics working with microorganisms. And it wasn't until um, my, my first year in, in graduate school where I, I randomly heard a talk from uh, Carlos Brody, who became my, my, my graduate PhD advisor. And it was all about animal systems. And afterwards, I went up and talked to him and said, this is, this is, this is awesome. Like, I need, I need to be in your lab <laughs> because this is, the, this is the type of math that I wanted to do. And I hmm. knew very little about neuroscience at that point because um, I had been a different type of biologist, but kind of joined the lab, built some stuff and, and learned a bunch. And so, so I feel like I, I kind of came in from this field. Um, so Asian talked about how she came in the field from, from physics. I kind of came in actually from, from, from biology, um, even though we arrived at largely overlapping research interests. So yeah, so, so I think, I think the, 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 the work that I'm probably people still know me um, for is, is, my, is the work I did with Carlos. This is uh, some, some papers we wrote. Um, I think at the time, one of the first sets of papers that established rodents as a viable system for studying decision making and uh, and cognitive processes, and so I had developed a um, a, a task for for studying decision making using rodents, um, where the information coming in was uncertain and it was was really variable, and along with um, a. Uh, of, of, of actually dynamical systems um, framework for for modeling this behavior, um, and so since then I've I've really been drifting kind of more towards I've, I've been more drawn towards naturalistic behaviors, and so a lot of what my lab works on now is using tools from dynamical systems to understand the, the neural computations underlying behaviors that are unstructured and long term and sometimes have multi scale dynamics. And, uh, and using these analytic tools to connect not only the neural activity, but connecting it with kinematics and other behavior measures. And, and so that's what I really love doing now. And I think it's really hard for me to, to pick a, a favorite project because we work on so many different things. Um, so there's projects in my lab now focusing um, on everything between insects. Uh, we have a couple projects on rodents, um, non-human primates, and then we have a large project on, on, on human clinical data as well. And so, so everything, everything from, from, from insects to humans is my favorite. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I would say that um, there's one, one technique that is, a, uh, that is a kind of a vectorized generalization of a very simple linear model, um, as we have talked about in, in Linear Systems Day. Um, 
that we've been working on called dynamic mode decomposition. Mm -hmm. um, and we've, we've used it for a variety of systems. It, um, I, think, I think the success of this method, uh, which also came from, from physics, from fluid physics, is, is an example of the unreasonable effectiveness of linear models. It is at its core, a very linear, a very simple set of assumptions. And it almost doesn't make sense that it should well work as well as it does, uh, but it does. And so we, we go with it. I feel like everyone is from physics now. So hearing that you're from biology was kind of uh, an interesting diversion, although it was biophysics and I'm sure it was kind of, sounded pretty physics heavy in your biological background. So you weren't uh, stamp collecting, as they say, perhaps. No, I've always loved math and physics and, uh, and, and computer science, but I think I, I knew from, from earlier on in my training that I wanted to study biology. Konica, you've always uh, despised math and physics, right? <laughs> well, I'm a giant stereotype. Um, so I come at it from an engineering perspective. So hi, I'm Kanaka Rajan. I am an assistant professor um, in the Friedman Brain Institute and um, the Department of Neuroscience at, uh, at Mount Sinai in New York. Um, like, like my um, brilliant colleagues here, I'm also a computational neuroscientist. Um, I run, you know, a small lab here. Um, and, you know, I have my, my undergraduate degree was in, you know, biochemical engineering and biotechnology. And then, you know, I studied physics for a while, then, you know, essentially lapsed out of uh, physical sciences fields and self-identify as a biologist now. Um, so, you know, I'm not an engineer. I don't want to build the, the smartest AI that does the most effective state of the art, whatever. I want to build the machines that with all their bumps and warts, can help us understand the biological um, brain um, in air quotes, or the biological nervous system that given the constraints that biology has put on the fact that neurons fire at a certain time scale or their synaptic dynamics, then what is the system capable of doing and why it does so? Um, and so there's the dreaded mechanism word. Um, so that's what my lab is, um, is devoted to doing. Um, so in, in keeping with the theme of last week, I can tell you about the stuff that I'm the best known for and the stuff that, um, you know, I am secretly the most proud of. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the secret pride, uh, so the stuff that I'm actually most known for is the fact that I build these recurrent neural network models and train them to match the dynamics from real experimental data. So I've done this in a variety of nervous systems from larval zebrafish, mice, um, and macaques, and recently with, with the human systems. So that's sort of the body of work that I'm the most commonly associated with. And yes, I'm super proud of it and all that. But, um, but I think in, in taking a page from Adrian's book, I too am secretly proud of, um, of an early um, piece of work that I did. It, um, I, and, and I hesitate to say this out loud, but it had very little to do with actual biology. It, it had these idealized, um, randomly connected model neurons. And, you know, in that particular randomly connected recurrent neural network model, I wanted to ask how um, networks in the brain or in the biological system reconcile um, subtle inputs with all this rich ongoing activity um, that they have going on. So, you know, we have all of these rich internal states and dynamics um, and in, in the old days, they would just model the biological brain or the nervous system like a light bulb, right? You flicked on the switch and something happened, but if you flicked it off, nothing happened. But that's clearly not how nervous systems work. There's a lot of spontaneous activity that is in some sense almost, you know, as rich as um, stimulus evoked responses. So how do brains then reconcile sensitivity to subtle um, inputs and why aren't we hallucinating? the whole time. So that's the biological spirit of the question, but we just essentially did a mean field calculation in this idealized, um, you know, random network scenario. And it's a calculation that I'm, I'm kind of um, secretly the most proud of. I wonder if that's a, uh, a trend that people are most proud of some of their earliest work, because often that's the most hard fought as well, coming in and not understanding as much and having to work harder just to make anything work or make sense of anything. That's right. I mean, it was also for me the first spark of something having clicked, right? I don't want to, you know, say, oh, scientific discovery and big poobah words, but it was the closest I've experienced that for the first time was when, you know, things just kind of worked that one day and the feeling I had on the inside. So 
And I think partly also to give credit to our people in our labs that once you have a lab, you know, a lot of the great ideas are coming in concert between you and, and the people in the lab. Whereas when you're, you know, doing your postdoc work, your early faculty work, it's it's all you, right? Mm. And I think that's partly why I think we feel so connected to that work. Very well put. Since you mentioned uh, lab, there's about a thousand questions I want to ask, but uh, maybe I'll start with this. Um, considering the different roles, you know, that you have once you are running a lab versus when you're starting out, uh, how how you feel like the nature of your questions uh, have changed over time? Sort of the trajectory of your thinking, uh, you know, have they become more narrow, uh, broader? I know many of you work across many different animal species, and how just how you approach the questions that you're interested in. Is there an easy way for you to characterize how that's changed over the course of your uh, careers? It's a great question. And I, I think that part of um, what, what makes you a PI, right, is that you have a certain flavor of questions you like to ask and a certain approach to the way you ask them. But at the same time, we have been living in a decade or two where techniques and you know, machine learning has sort of changed hugely. And so that uh, requires us to continually, you know, sort of shift the way the way we're approaching problems. And for me, that that is really an intimately tied up with with the people coming into the lab, you know, who are often, you know, because of Neuromatch and other you know, other experiences, much more deeply trained in in some of the new techniques than I am. And so you know, I'm sort of, sort of steering the ship of sort of trying to provide. The questions and the taste, maybe to to what kinds of things are interesting to ask, and and you know to some extent, you know, hoping that my students are really really uh, most knowledgeable down in the weeds on some of some of the newer approaches. So you're like the neuromodulator to their uh, exactly smaller network <laughs> dynamics. Right, I see. Right. That totally resonates with me. What Adrian just said, um, the 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 metaphor of being the modulator. I I, I definitely have benefited tremendously from. I'm students and postdocs in my lab who have a lot of expertise that I definitely do not have. Um, and I'll, I'll definitely confess that, that there have been many papers we've written where I, I can't tell you the details, right? Like, I, I, I trust that they've been done correctly. We've had people working together on it, but I personally cannot explain to you all the guts of, of all the derivations. And, and to some extent, it was just a process of coming to terms with that, that that's, that's kind of okay in some circumstances. And that's what we have collaborators for. And I feel like increasingly, I feel like my role is as a, uh, almost like a project manager. Like I figure out what are the problems that should be, that should be asked? What are the good questions to ask? Um, a, a, an overcomplete set. I ask too many questions. That's, I show up to questions. I show up to meetings. I ask a lot of questions. Most of them no good answers and that's okay. Um, and then, and then I figure out, okay, so what's, what's the team of people that we need to get to, to, to attack this using whatever tools are necessary. So do we need to get, do we need to hire an electrophysiologist who is an expert in this particular system? Do we need a statistical machine learning person who specializes in this technique, whatever it is, right? And then find the resources, the human resources, and also the, the, the computing resources, the experimental resources, whatever it is, and put the team together and uh, just hope that, hope that they gel and hope that something really wonderful happens. And so, so I think I, you know, when it doesn't work, I, I can't, I take the, I take blame uh, when it, when it works, works wonderfully, I take very little of the credit. It's, it's the team working together. Kind of well, I feel answer? like I have very little to add to this, uh, this amazing picture that um, Adrian and Bing have, um, have painted. I, so personally, I think I've also been, um, so yeah, you know, the, there was like a research proposal that I came to Sinai to start my lab with, right? There was this mental picture. It starts with a chalk talk. You make yourself a research program. Maybe even your first grant is based on these ideas that you think you want to execute on. And then, you know, some of them do go in that direction, but then there were these amazing pivots that, you know, I must confess I resisted initially. And those pivots are, yes, as painted by Adrian and Bing in their, in their picture, driven by the people in the, that have come to work alongside me in the lab, but also because of experimental colleagues kind of nudging the, the ship in, in, in different directions. Um, so, you know, usually we're, we're sparked, uh, an interesting problem occurs when, you know, you've made, somebody has made an experimental observation and you go, oh, geez, I wonder why that is. And then we build up a model and then we talk to the experimentalist who basically tells you in about, you know, five or six months that it takes them to do an experiment optimistically and say, you're completely wrong and this is completely mad. This is not how any of this works at all. 
So then very soon you've, you know, you have to rewire your model, build a whole other architecture, a different framework um, and a different way of looking at it. And so, you know, I have had projects that have gone in unexpected directions because of, um, of talking to experimentalists alongside my team. Um, and so, you know, an example of that is, you know, working on maladaptive states. So, you know, anyone that knows my work knows that I've worked on, essentially, I'm a basic scientist, right? I've worked on mechanisms of learning, remembering, and deciding in essentially healthy animal models. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, at a, I'm at a medical school where, you know, translational research is incredibly valued and clinical people as well as experimentalists are, you know, hemorrhaging data in different experiments from animal models of various neuropsychiatric diseases, about which we actually know very, very little. Um, so yes, there's computational psychiatry as a field, but computational neuroscience itself has not traditionally focused very much on um, disease mechanisms. So my initial instinct was to say, well, we'll just look at error trial data, right? The ways that animals screw up may have something to do with maladaptive states. Turns out, no, completely, completely wrong. So we threw out a whole bunch of our models because it turns out just adding noise to networks doesn't exactly disease make. <laughs> I could have asked somebody, but you know, that's how one learns. Um, so, you know, yeah. this is um, an example. I really love the role that um, the students and postdocs have to in, in both bringing new ideas and in, in sort of dragging you in new directions. You know, I have one of my, my first um, rotation students, he was super keen and he's just great. Barry Walker, if some of you might know him, he, um, he came uh, to, to start his rotation over the summer because he was so keen to get, to get going. And I gave him a project connected with the work we'd done, analyzing the Hodgkin-Huxley neuron and so had an idea about how he could extend our model to have a kind of multiple timescales of, of adaptation. And he went away about two weeks later, came back and said, yeah, I tried it. It doesn't really work. But I saw this great talk, you know, <laughs> I was at Stanford about this technique, IMAP. And I think, you know, there's this nonlinear dimensionality reduction technique that I think could be a really interesting way to look at the system. And so often running <laughs> with that. A very prescient, actually, because that's exactly what we are, our lab are using kind of routinely now to, to analyze all kinds of, of nonlinear data. So was, that's the kind of way that, that you know, experiences like, like this course or random seminars can help, help um, our students you know, introduce new things into the research program. In that case, it sounds like it was kind of a horizontal direction move, right? Because it was kind of a technique. But often are these getting dragged into different directions, helplessly and happily, I suppose? Yeah, Would that you say happens that, too. <laughs> yeah, well, sure. Yeah, dead ends and whatnot. But, you know, over the course of your research career, do you ask more and more narrow questions into the nuances or bigger and bigger questions? Or is it just, uh, does it run the gamut? In my lab, definitely runs the gamut. You know, mm -hmm. so an example of, of a new new direction that a student brought me into, you know, she uh, she was very interested in development. And I'm terrified of development. You know, it's a, everything's <laughs> changed. We love change, right? But there's a lot of change. And I really... You know, I, I hadn't ever done any any real reading into that, but she was fascinated by it. So she went off to Woods Hole. She had been she'd come from cognitive sciences, so didn't really have deep experimental training. She went off to neurosystems and behavior or neurobiology at Woods Hole. Learned how to get into a lab. Started a new collaboration with someone else, you know, with Bill Moody and in, uh, in the biology department. Started working on on a whole new system. We then had, you know, three or so papers about that. We, I started to write grants with Bill Moody. <laughs> I had other students kind of come through that, that research direction that I would never have initiated without, without Rebecca. So it, it always does seem to come back to um, the answer to m many questions asked uh, these days about what is the right level to study things at? What is the right system to use? The answer is always, it depends on your question. So in Neuromatch, one of the things uh, students learn is uh, single neuron activity and uh, modeling dendrites as part of a single neuron and focusing at the single neuron level. And then, and then the the dynamical systems approach is like zoomed way out uh, to a you know larger uh, level. And and I kind of want to get this uh, back to the the question of the single neuron doctrine versus the population doctrine versus what is the right doctrine we should all be following? And what do we need to be paying more attention to? Because these days, it's with the, especially with uh, deep learning, it's, you know, the, the, the poor, lonely, single neuron doesn't seem to have a role anymore. It doesn't matter. 
uh, when you get into those cognitive things? Or does it? What do you guys think? Oh, gosh, what a great question. Hey, yeah. I'd love to have to ask that we just drop the word doctrine. I think yeah, please. I want to get I rid of it, too. That's I why I don't want to be a way of drama. Exactly. Yeah, right. just, can we abolish it, please? Yes. Yeah, right. Okay, I we're done here. No, I never, no, I never. I mean, Kahal's picture about the single neuron, it was was. Um, an idea, right? That the neuron was was um, a complete information processing unit, which is fine. There was never a claim that that was that everything uh, was built around coding properties of single neurons. Rather, that they are units of computation that obviously are built into networks. We know that, and that's always been clear, right? From every drawing that's ever been made of a nervous system. And so, I think that it's been fascinating to me how much can be done without worrying about the single neuron. You know, a lot of our work has been zooming in on the details of biophysics using dynamical systems, actually, you know, to make the link between how underlying nonlinear dynamical processes can translate into coding models. And the single neuron is a great, you know, building ground for that because you know everything, right? You know all the, you have the complete um, conductance-based system from which you can start, whereas when you're working with a, a biological neural network, at least, there's many parameters that you don't know and much higher dimensional. But if one wants to sort of systematically understand how a nonlinear you know, physical system leads to something that looks like a coding model, then the single neuron is a, is a wonderful kind of um, you know, sandbox for, for that. And so I, you know, what I think our work on that has shown, and that of many, many others, is that single neurons are capable of a very interesting, but not infinite, you know, range of computations at the individual neuron level. And I believe that that matters, right? And so, of course, it's possible to, and, you know, as Kanaka's work has really beautifully shown, it's possible to, to show right, that you can get um, the firing rates from a particular neuron by a model that that works at you know at a somewhat more abstracted level, right? You build a, a network that has you kind of make up the properties of the network, and yet you can train all the parameters to do you know reproduce the activity of a single neuron. In real life, right, that's that's not actually what's going on. Individual neurons are transforming their inputs with very particular rules that depend on on the underlying ion channel distributions. And as we learn more about, about single neuron cell types, right, the, those rules do vary across different brain areas, across, across cortex under, you know, four different cell types. That has, to, that has to matter. It is possible to build models that don't care about that because they're very high dimensional, right? So they can kind of sweep all that under, under the rug. What I think is important about those rules, one is that we may it may allow neural systems to do complex computations with fewer units, right? That you have all of this interesting molecular machinery under the hood, and so you turn every neuron into a complex uh, computational element. So maybe you know maybe that that makes it simpler in in some ways because you you have these these rich elements. But the other piece of that that I think we have to care about is that. These are the properties that we can manipulate with drugs or with genetic manipulation. You know, these are the knobs that we have is to influence the way different ion channels work, the way they interact with different kinds of molecules. And so if we're ever going to be able to take our, our high-level models and translate them into, into treatments or, or understanding of how drugs you know, interact with the brain, we're going to have to you know, understand those, those knobs. So that's my my yeah. doctor <laughs> yeah. extremely doctor. extremely well put adrian as um as as usual i i, I honestly think that um, i mean she um, adrian kind of captured everything that i would have wanted to say um on, on this i think it's a taste in problems thing right there isn't one all encompassing level of description um and i think there's a little bit of the of, of, of our tendency as people with physical sciences backgrounds to look for this one unifying theory that ties everything with a bow. And I think that approach may have, it's misleading. Honestly, what is gonna happen is we'll have a bunch of integrative theories and models and some collective understanding will emerge from it. And pieces of those theories will include biophysics um, and all of the richness of individual neurons. 
Um, and some of them will include much more abstract models depending on your taste and problems. That would be my take. Do you have uh, hope or optimism, though? So I think that's perfectly fine to have a patchwork of different levels. Um, and, and often people kind of uh, zone in on one level. When they have one question, they think about one level to answer their question at that given level. And maybe you can verbally relate it to some other things. But uh, but do you have any optimism that there might be some sort of um, integrative, uh, I want to say hierarchical structure where or principles by which we can have a more holistic across level appreciation of these systems, or we re- do they really need to be independent uh, levels that we just have to be happy with? I have optimism. I don't know if it's based on anything. <laughs> yeah, I'm optimistic as well. Um, I think I think Adrian brought up uh, brought up development earlier, and um, I think that's actually a really interesting clue for me. I am I like Adrian. I have almost no training in actual developmental biology, and I'm also terrified by it. But but I have this feeling that is super duper important because that's what um, I mean, along with evolution, development is what differentiates biological systems from physical systems fundamentally. And so, trying to understand the the brain as it is a fully formed thing is is somewhat of a a uh, very incomplete picture because it grew that way and the plan for which it grew at that way also grew that way over a much longer time frame and so those are really important constraints in my mind for how we understand it as a whole because you can't have a network of neurons that is incapable of getting to the state it is when it actually does work in the adult animal um, and then we're ignoring neurodegeneration um, as kind of mentioned earlier right which is a very important part of the understanding the system as well so I don't, I don't have a solution, but I think I'm kind of optimistic that, that once we can look at the system not as a, as a fully baked thing that works and does a thing that's well characterized, but think about how it got there, maybe, maybe that's a kind of a sideways, um, a sideways approach to that question that may be fruitful. I don't know. I think, I think there's a, definitely a c- couple of our colleagues are doing really, really cool work in the computational neuroscience of developing nervous systems. And I'm, I'm really quite hopeful that, that more people will go into that field. Yeah, I mean, development is such a hard problem. I mean, mm-hmm. I'm just super amazed. I mean, as they, I mean, you both kind of confess to feeling a little bit of a terror to it, right? Yeah. It's like, oh my God, everything is changing, right? The hardware is changing, the software is changing. Yeah, it was hard enough as it is, and it's still changing. <laughs> <laughs> right over such a long time scale that what do you even do uh, right and the task that the that the network is supposed to be doing is also changing wildly the whole time but i think it's it's, it's a holy grail problem that the two of you are working on so so it's kind of amazing i mean my uh, attempt at l- working on something that is longitudinal is looking at learning trajectories mm-hmm. so you know take a fully fledged um, adult animal and what does it look like when it's naively placed on in in the task for the first time and over the process of shaping starts to look a lot like this expert animal so what happens then can we look at state space representations or can we look at behavioral changes over these weeks that it takes animals to learn a task and tell me if you know i don't know a mouse learned in seattle or a mouse learned in new york um, are the, those trajectories are different, but the final state of this animal having done the task are identical in both scenarios. So how I, do you build models that can distinguish these learning trajectories? It's, it's a topic that's of interest to me, but it's nowhere as complex, I imagine, as the development problem that, that you two are um, I think, you know, the question of learning is a really interesting one that comes back to, to Paul's questions about sort of the interface between single neurons and networks. You know, I've always been intrigued by, by this sort of throwaway line in the, at the end of the Bliss and Lomo you know, LTP paper where they're sort of, well, you know, we've characterized this, this synaptic plasticity rule, but, but there are all kinds of other ways for neurons to be plastic. Right? You can, they can express mm-hmm. different numbers of ion channels. And you know, there's beautiful work by Sasha Lack and others that show that excitability properties of neurons can change dynamically over time. And of course, homeostasis, you know, lovely mm-hmm. work by Gina Trigiano and others. And so I, I worry sometimes that our classic ideas about, about neural network training are missing a lot of really cool stuff that biology can do that that you know may implement totally different kinds of learning roles that operate on much lower timescales or that change excitability in interesting ways, right? 
So, you know, not just raise or lower a threshold that would be, you know, that you could equally map onto a, a synaptic weight change. And so there, there feels like, you know, there are good reasons to keep paying attention to the single neuron level and the, the cool, you know, molecular dynamics of single neurons, because we may, may, we may realize that there's a whole richness there that, that we're, you know, in neglecting at the moment. I feel like it's, I could start an entirely new podcast for hundreds of episodes called Throwaway Lines, just about lines that were that crop up again X amount of years later that were in some paper that people take as rule, uh, but, but then show a very different side of it. Here's a, here's a throwaway question. How many years back should we look in, in the literature to find great ideas that weren't ready for their, that were ahead of their time that are now ready to be used from a, let's say a computational nurse, you know, different people in different fields have different answers to this question. I mean, didn't one of you just cite Golgi in your talk, like, or Cajal, I think? Somebody said Cajal. I often uh, have started a few talks lately with, um, with a quote about, you know, basically, you know, neurons firing, firing in a, in a synchronous way, making those two neural groups being connected and ask people to guess where that came from. And they say, well, it must be Heb. And in <laughs> fact, it was William James you know, from yep. the 18, 1890s, right? So if, if you know, my husband's been doing a lot of, of research lately into you know, Turing and others, you know, there are so many insightful ideas buried in, in 1950s papers in McCulloch of Pitts. You know, these guys really had thought through a huge number of things that we, um, we're still rediscovering. So, I, you know, I don't know whether the most efficient way is to read all the literature <laughs> and look for interesting things or whether, you know, I think we all do need, and, you know, people feel bad about this, but I think it's true. We kind of need to discover things for ourselves. You know, I think you most deeply understand something when you figure it out yourself and then okay it's often very disappointing to realize that this idea is out there already you know be, you've been scooped or whatever but that doesn't obviate the the value of of realizing it uniquely and coming to it through a path of of understanding it that you've built up yourself and so I think the idea of being scooped is just not something we should we should be so distressed about. <laughs> You've got a, a you you now have a starting point that's a very different basis for discovering new things than if you had just read the line in a paper and 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 copied it. I would like to add to that by saying that perhaps we should also be talking to people in um, maybe related fields or unexpectedly related fields. And you know, this is you know I've had a very sort of traditional. Um, you know, root in science, right? You just wed yourself to the science track if you were, um, I was raised in India and that's just how it went. So I'd never had occasion to study, you know, philosophy of mind, for example, mm -hmm. um, cognitive neuroscience. But in my recent experience, I would say maybe like a year and a half, dating back only a year and a half, I figured that there's whole bodies of work where they've thought about these deep, and to some of you, this may be obvious, um, that they've thought about these deep questions way before we had the technical ability to even think about measuring them. Yep. So the, I think the controversial statement is that philosophers and artists have probably seen farther than we can or have years ago, decades ago. Um, so it's, it's probably diversity of um, approaches, talking to people from other fields that has, um, that has been like, oh my God, this brilliant idea wasn't exactly, you know, it was already said by somebody else way back when. But, but all of that takes a lot of time and effort, and people don't have time. I mean, Neuromatch Academy, I know, is intense for people, and this goes back to the idea of being driven by questions, um, and what Adrienne just said about needing to do the work yourself to really get a grasp on things and know, have a viewpoint where you can then use that to pivot and think about things in different ways. And it's, uh, would you agree that to get so all the work that people are doing in Neuromatch right now, Neuromatch Academy, that's the thing that's worth it is, is the actual doing it yourself and maybe not feeling like you're progressing, but it's probably the most worthwhile way you can do it. I agree with that. You know, I think that this is why we do courses. This is, you know, you could just download the, the thing, right, from your, your, your model from someone else's paper. And that's a great way to do it. But going through a real course, a real school where you kind of build it up from, from the ground upward, I think is, is just very valuable to going forward. It, obviously, we're in, a, you know, we're in a golden era where so much is now available online. People are so great about sharing their tools and their models and their methods. And 
that is accelerating science, but just once in a while, right? Maybe at this early phase to to take that deep dive and and to build up your 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 background. You know, when when people we have a lot, you know, I teach a lot of summer classes and and we try to make them accessible both to people coming from physics who need to understand so what's the state of the art in neuroscience and how can I apply these tools in neuroscience, but also people um, who who came through biology and really want to quickly catch up on the mathematics and the physics that they need. And the regret that we often hear, right, from from biology people is that they didn't take more math and more physics early on in their career. And it's not because, you know, they need to remember the the formula for the quadratic you know, equation or whatever. It's because that practice of, of just working through problems is what you get in physics. It's not any one thing. It's not a, a formula or a rule. It's it's the training in starting at the beginning of a problem and working all the way through it that 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 you know background gives you and so that's that's the hard thing to catch up on but i think an intense experience like a summer school is kind of the best way you can you can do it it's like doing an immersion course in language or something like that right you you kind of get that accelerated trajectory through it I agree with everything Adrian said, and I think um, a related point that I've been thinking about is also the the value of the value of repetition, which is another thing that you would get from a more traditional quantitative education as you might get in physics and 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 um, and engineering. Um, so so for example, i um I've been teaching for many years a, a class for for undergraduates, which, among other things, i I teach them with the principal component analysis, right? so so, I, I, I teach them what it is, and, and then I tell them, now that you know what it is, you're going to start seeing it everywhere, like literally everywhere. You may not have heard it before, but now that you know what it is, it's going to pop up everywhere. And it's true, right? So some of it for me is just that 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 fluency uh, with talking through the quantitative stuff, the computational stuff, doing enough of it yourself that you then start seeing connections other places. I think the the wonderful point that Kanika made earlier about talking to people who are in related fields and kind of adjacent fields. I think I completely agree with that, but I think some of the difficulty that I've had in talking to other people from different fields is often just the language because they may have had a very brilliant idea that it's totally exactly what I've been working on, but we're speaking a different dialect and I just don't understand what they're saying until we can kind of meet somewhere in the middle. And I think, I think that's also um, one thing that I, at least I try to be valuable in collaborations of that kind, because I do have, um, I don't know, kind of a, a, a diverse set of training and experiences um, that even though I am not often or very rarely the often the expert on the thing we're actually doing, I can speak all of the various languages and kind of bring people together. All right? I can tell my experimental colleague, no, the thing that you want to do is actually call this technical term. And I can go to my, my math, mathematician colleagues and say, okay, here is the, the thing that the, the biologists really want to do. And I can, I, can, I can write it down for you as an optimization function. Like, can you solve that problem? And I go, yeah, I can totally do that. But the two of them may not have got, got, gotten to that point by themselves, or at least not, not as quickly. And, and so, so having some fluency with both, I think, is, is, is quite valuable. And it just takes, it takes repetition. It takes doing it yourself. And I think being a, you know, the world's leading expert on that very specific thing is 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 great, but not not necessary for for making progress forward. Especially as we go forward in neuroscience, where often often there's large teams of people working on it, right? So not no one individual needs to be a deep deep expert on every single part of the thing. We can all agree that no one knows what the hell developmental biologists are talking about, right? Their language it's just not a it's not understandable. That's the problem, maybe. <laughs> There's words. There's a lot of words. We use words. Yeah. Maybe we can go back to uh, another thing that Adrian uh, mentioned earlier, talking about the potential importance of um, details at the single neuron um, level. So it seems to me the trend, uh, yes, um, ecologically valid behaviors has become more popular and more important. Um, and there are plenty of models you know, that are trying to use some of the computations at the um, at the single neuron level, like apical dendrites versus basal dendrites to incorporate those, incorporate those into artificial networks. But I would say on the whole, the trend is the importance of biological processes uh, has really gone by the wayside, has really decreased over time. Uh, do you agree with that within the computational neuroscience? And it's become very uh, computational, very non-biological, very stale in in most other ways. 
Would you agree with that? And, and would you think that the trend is uh, should be that way? Or Kanika, go ahead. You're just shaking your head. You can just start talking. I, I don't think I agree. I think that, you know, I think we're actually going the other way. So, you know, we're in this era where we're, where experimental colleagues are recording more and more from nervous systems. And we can certainly argue about whether more is necessarily better. But, you know, we have access due to explosive neurotechnological developments to larger and larger portions of the nervous system during behaviors in some case, and the ability to record and manipulate at the same time and so forth, right? So when that first sort of set off, theorists, at least speaking for myself, felt a little bit like we were on a, on a back front, right? Like we were on a back foot. We were building these sort of abstract models at a time when it was valuable, but they couldn't actually be tested because, you know, who's going to record from all of this to know? Now we know, right? There's a lot of structure in these networks, um, in the, in the, in the, even in the very small nervous systems where you can have, you know, highly sampled um, data sets, they're very highly structured. There's very little that actually looks completely random. Um, so, you know, the work that I said that I was kind of secretly the most proud of is actually the thing that is wildly unrealistic. Um, so in some sense, now everybody is pushing for more biological features, um, even, you know, landmark papers on, you know, the visual architecture must be hierarchical. Therefore, it is a pure, you know, confnet or a pure deep network. Even those papers have now augmented their findings with, um, you know, feedback projections with different kinds of cell types with a tighter link to biology. So I don't particularly agree that we're going away from it. Yeah, I, 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 feel, I feel like Paul is talking about a, um, you know, more a trend in the community of who's getting, you know, talks and giving talks and getting podcasted and whatever. There definitely has been, uh, I think, a swing towards a style of doing computational neuroscience, which is fitting, fitting RNNs. And that's, it's, it's a very cool tool and it's very of the moment and it's doing all kinds of great stuff. And I don't think we should... Um, you know, I don't want to critique that either. I think it's a really important piece of of our library of possibilities of how to how to go ahead with neuroscience. I think at the same time, there are many people who are, remain aware and care right about about the role of of single neuron properties and want to put them in. And eventually, those things will come together. I, I think that they're. I agree. Yeah, you know, that that the biophysicists haven't gone away. We haven't forgotten about that. It, and if if anything it's more that we don't quite yet know how to do it well. And I think that really comes back to the point you raised earlier, okay. Paul, about, you know, how do we do this kind of multi, multi-level multi modeling? I think we're still struggling for, for good tools um, to do that well. And, it, you know, we, we have all this amazing new data from the Allen Institute where they're characterizing single cell, you know, physiological properties. Now we can see, you know, where those single cells are in circuits. Now it kind of, now the... Well, the you know the shit is hitting the fan in terms of us having to actually make use of that data, and I, I think there's a kind of oh, you know, my, my husband sometimes puts it as you know, it's a, well, you know, the dog caught the car, right? You know, now we have to actually you know handle it, and and I think that is the challenge of of the next era is is bringing together what everyone said we needed, right? Characterization of single cell property. What do they all do? You know, where are they in the in the neural network? Um, what are the connectivity rules with you know, on the other hand, which are which are very elegant, you know, methods to just fit, you know, train a neural network. You don't even have to take into account any of that. And you know, there and then you have someone like Kanika who's really kind of at that interface where you could just train your network, but actually what if you constrain it with some with some real recordings? And that we have to keep going along that route, you know, can we now constrain, constrain cell types and what, you know, ask how that helps or hinders right, our ability to fit those models. And so I think one of the, the downsides, of course, of that is that it gets more and more sort of detailsy. And, you know, when you start to give those talks, people's eyes kind of glaze over. And so it's, it's less easy to soundbite or to, or to even do, you know, it's, it's a lot, becomes a lot more murky exactly how to, how to use that information. I think we are hoping, waiting for some cool method or cool way of thinking about it that lets us do that elegantly. And in a way that, that doesn't feel like just a slog of, of parameter, you know, fitting. Which uh, maybe it's, that is the way it is. <laughs> maybe that is the answer. But 
those of us coming from physics and other other fields hold out a belief that there is some beautiful way right to capture to capture all those those effects and those influences that is straightforward to talk about and not not just a an exercise in bazillion parameters i mean a related question to that is is the actual processes of of life right life is not important to cognition that's another problem um so Metabolic processes, unimportant to cognition. All they do uh, is to make the brain more efficient and have been evolutionarily carved to um, make our brains run on 20 watts, but they're not important for cognition, right? I mean, that's another part of the question is, it's all, it used to be all spikes, now it's all population dynamics. Do we really, you know, thinking about the, the multi-level integration, is life anywhere in this so, you know, the NIH has a whole set of, I mean, they have a whole entire working group, um, whole fields of research devoted to, I mean, broadly called multi-scale modeling. And they do look at physiological processes and their interface with, um, with, uh, with neuronal dynamics as we know it. So, you know, in, in the spirit of what you're trying to get, I think, at is that we have to have some skepticism in our favorite tools. Right. I mean, you know, I do, you know, I like the fact that I'm fitting RNNs to biological data, but I don't actually believe that, you know, the brain is making, you know, little analog continuous signals or not. They're making actual spikes with all of this rich biophysics underneath it. When different cells have different, you know, they have types. Our best idea for a neuromodulator is a very slow sine wave. So I think we got to, you know, have a little skepticism, but there are you know, there's a whole meeting on gliodynamics. Um, every few years, I'm old enough to know that every few years there's a cycle. Everybody seems to be super keen on glia. They make an appearance everywhere and then it goes away. Those guys, they're going to go down swinging. They're going to really... Right? Know, and then we forget about them for a while and then they keep coming. I recently found out that there are chorionic cells on the inside lining of the ventricles in the brain that are, you know, mm-hmm. actually responsible for controlling neural dynamics. Vasculature is linked very heavily with uh, with dynamics, um, specifically dopaminergic terminals and so forth. So there's a whole other level, right? You asked about biophysics and properties of single cells, but at the physiological systems level, there are whole other fields of research that try to get at the two, at the link between neural. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's kind of silly to to say that cognition has nothing to do with life. It means. <laughs> it may be a bit unpopular, but sometimes I like to I like to say that the brain doesn't actually do anything except control muscles. Like there's no output really. So you you say you said it's silly to to say that cognition has does have something or does not have something to do. With I life. just I don't see how you can possibly dissociate the two. Dissociate. Uh, because if you think about why we even have a nervous system in the first place, it's to control our bodies in the real physical world. Well, and, also, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we're also thinking things, we're reading, for example, without a motor output. Right. Like, even your internal processes, where I, I, I get, like, I know I talk to my cognitive science colleagues and sometimes they get mad at me, but I say it anyway. Um, like, the fact that we have long term memory, the fact that we can, we have our internal monologue, right? We make decisions, we can imagine the futures and plan for the future, stuff like that. All of that is because the size of our bodies and the duration of our lives say a number of decades and how we are like a meter tall lips over a couple of decades. Like in order to function that way in the real world, you have to be able to plan for the future. If you were a plankton size, we wouldn't have a nervous system and plankton don't have sophisticated nervous systems. Like we what do. What about hydra? Just, hydra size? Well, I don't know. Let's ask Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> they don't seem to have a lot of memory. You know, we, it's been, it's been very elusive to find um, mm-hmm. any kind of learning in, in hydra. And so they, you know, they control their body, but they live and they, well, they, they do live for They live in the present. <laughs> they move them over. They, they, they live in the present. They're a nerve net though. Sorry, I, I didn't they're mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, no, it's cool. I love Hydra. I wanted to learn more about it. Um, yeah, it's just, it, it, I think part of, part of this is why I, in, in, in my lab's work, we've been drawn more to, for lack of a better term, more tractable systems where we can actually kind of access every part of the system from the sensory inputs to the neural computations and back out to the motor outputs and then have a notion of what the biophysical feedback is. 
like that, that entire loop that is, that is life. The thing that I actually do every day, right? Like I take sensory inputs, I make some decisions, I do some stuff and that has an impact on the world and it comes back to me like that whole thing, right? Rather than studying each part of it by itself, um, trying to put it together. Right. And that's really, really difficult over the, over the time scales of, of, I don't even minutes, hours, days, right. But it is possible for, for relatively accessible sensory motor loops. And so, so we've done, we've been kind of slowly going in that direction for the reason that I, I find that personally intellectually satisfying to think about the whole thing as a closed loop system. And parts of it are, are really detailed biophysics, right? And parts of it are, are not where we don't really know what kind of models fit the data. And so we just, we just fit the data however we can. And these are more phenomenological models. And so I think there may be a intermediary of, of, of these models is, is just a hodgepodge of phenomenological models that are glued together with, with biophysical models. And we're just doing the best we can, but, but with the idea that the whole thing actually is interactive, right? This is a, this is an agent and it actually interacts with the world. And, and so explaining each piece of it by itself, I mean, that, that's very great. And I like definitely take advantage of a lot of that work. Um, but, but I, I find it really satisfying to try to put the whole thing together. Given the popularity of manifolds these days in dynamical systems theories to describe popula- populations of neurons and what they're doing on a lower dimensional scale, do you think that we will eventually be using some sort of law-like terms to describe thoughts uh, as we creep closer and closer into uh, cognition? I-, I know Bing only has thoughts about movement and thinking uh, and uh, uh, projecting movements, apparently, but well, you, uh, I can see you're thinking and talking with your hands. <laughs> I'm not denying anything. Uh, <laughs> okay, all right, let's back off. Let's back off. No, but but um, you know, do we need because physics? The the celebration in physics has been laws uh, and describing things in laws mostly. Although I know that's changing, but uh, do you think that we're headed in that direction, or is that even a goal to head in in complex systems? Do we need law like? Um, uh, terms and ways of describing thoughts. See, I don't like this either. Sorry, I'm going to be a Debbie Downer on this question too. I think this word should also go the way of doctrine and dogma. Um, I think, okay, so I'm going to quote um, Kale, Kale Bling from MIT, Leslie Kale Bling. They said, um, biology is gnarly. Um, and I think I agree with that. I don't think there, I mean, yes, the pursuit of a, of a law is fine and all, but it's, it's sort of like the pursuit of understanding co- consciousness. It's to me that, you know, there isn't going to be one because biology is gnarly. It isn't, um, it isn't describable, I think, by, um, by any closed loop formula. Because even in the smallest nervous system that you can sample as completely as possible, there are many redundant pathways. Um, It might be optimized for a certain behavior, but the roots by which it is optimized are manifold with a different use of the word manifold. See what I did there, though? Nice. That was it. I'm done now. (laughs) I guess I'm a little confused by the question because the idea of manifolds, right, is just one way of expressing low dimensionality or, you know, and that, that has to be true, right? We have billions of neurons. We do a relatively small number of things with them. And so at some level, there has to be a reduction of dimensionality between the activity space of of billions of neurons and cognition or behavior. And so, you know, manifolds are one, one aspect of that, right? There maybe there is some well-structured, you know, space in which one can, one can see that. But it's going to be infinitely interleaved, right? There, you change something about the task; it's a slightly different manifold. So, what is the most convenient way to think about how low-dimensional representation? And you know, that's that's a great question. And you know, what I don't know if that would constitute a law. It just constitutes a better um, parameterization of the thing that we're studying, which is its neural activity. And so, I. I'm all for that, right? I, I think it's a very, it's the most appropriate thing we can try to do in neuroscience is to reduce our observations into some space in which we can start to see what the dynamics are doing and what they mean. And that's that's our goal. Whether that means that there's a law, I, you know, I don't think that that's necessary or even even important in a way. Against against doctrines and against laws. I'm I'm seeing the formation of a a nice review paper coming. 
Uh, so, uh, you know, this whole week is about like dynamics. It, are dynamics, is time appreciated enough enough in neuroscience? Uh, because this goes back to my, I know I'm harping on this, but this computational approach, um, like a Turing machine, doesn't doesn't give a damn about time, for instance, right? And it just goes from state to state. And when we, we talk about states, when we talk about computations, and but this recent stretch has been all about uh, time. Do we, do we think about time and incorporate it enough into our thinking? I think we do. And I, I think that the original way that, that some of the field came out kind of swinging against neural coding and everything's different now because we're talking about dynamical systems, kind of neglected that the fact that you know, visual neuroscience has been fully aware of time, all you know, not all along, if you go all the way back to Hubel and Wiesel, they neglected time, but a spatiotemporal receptive field, right, is a kernel that has a time dimension. And so I and so you can take a dynamical system and you can re-express it in terms of its Green's function, and then you have its its integral over time. Right? And so I I've been a you which you can think about as a temporal receptive field. And that's certainly from the beginning of my life in neuroscience, I felt like that was the approach I was taught by Bill Bialik and others. And so it was always a surprise to me that that was framed as such a paradigm shift. I feel like we've kind of known that all along. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone is fully on board right? that, you know, with that, with the issue of time, but, but I do feel like it's, it's deeply rooted in approaches for the last 30 years at least. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, cognition is dynamic, right? Things change over time. So how could we possibly not? I mean, I think we get ourselves in trouble when we take our models super, super seriously. Well, that's a little antithetical to the the whole Neuromatch Academy. I know, I know, I know. I'm like, you know, if I write a paper and then I say, uh, you know, a RNN model of, you know, pick favorite behavior. But if I say this is the unifying theory of cognition in the brain, that's uh, that starts to smell a lot like a law to me. And, you know, that it's, I know, I know I'm kind of tying two of your questions together, but it, it goes back to this thing. Time is a fundamental, con- fundamental piece of, um, of of behaviors and neural processing. Um, and I, and- I do hope it's not antithetical to to Duramatch Academy because one thing that we should all understand is that whatever method we're using right now is not the be all and end all. You know, you can try something, you get somewhere, it'll work, but there are going to be other methods that come along that are going to be better. So never take your method right, as dogma. There. You know, there's so many great people out there advancing these tools all the time, you know, with the help of amazing statisticians that so we're at a we're at a moment in time with respect to to the tools that we're using that will evolve further over time as we figure out better ways to do it. And so and I hope that that's the way that people have always been taught you know, in school, right, that that you need to know the the sort of the math of how to build tools, but the tools themselves are, are constantly moving. They're analogies to some extent for me, right? These models we build, they're representations and they're analogies and they're metaphors for, for what we're trying to, to understanding in, in, in biological reality. Sometimes I, I think back to, um, I, heard, I heard this, this, the, this rumor that, that because the most modern technology we have in our in our world are computers, and so it's it's and, and, and the brain is kind of like you know the most uh, inscrutable of all organs in our bodies, and so we make this analogy that oh, the brain must work like a computer, right? And so I often have a lot of um, friends who, especially who haven't studied biology much, just try to pin me down. It's like, well, so what is the hardware of the brain, and what is the software of the brain? They they must understand it in terms of this computer analogy. And I have to explain to them, well, it's not exactly like that, right? Like that analogy doesn't actually apply if you take it too literally. And then, and then back before computers, when steam engines was a was the most advanced technology that that we had, people had the steam engine analogy of the brain. It's like it was all pneumatics and 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 steam and you know pressure and hydraulics going going from these tubes that are inside your brain. And so I don't know. I don't know what the next one is going to be. Maybe when when humanity comes up with a with a more advanced technology than computers, so that will become, I don't know, maybe quantum computing. I know a lot of people like talking about that. I have no opinion on, on the matter, but it's not a lot of people, but there's non-zero people who who talk yes. about it. But in any case, I'm just wondering, right? Like so I don't I can't predict the future technology. And I'm wondering by the time that technology 
um, it becomes popular whether we will update our analogy of the brain as well, because we still will, will not have completely understood it by that point. All right, guys, I'm going to have one more question for you, and then we can, uh, and then if you have final thoughts, we can wrap up. If I were back at the beginning of my training, I would study or work on blank more and blank less. Being you have the, the scrunchiest face right now, let's start with you. You're really, you're really thinking about this. Kanika and Adria have better answers. I'm scratching my face. It's actually really difficult. I, I mean, I can I'll give you the stock <laughs> answer. I, get, yeah. so I think, I, I think so. we should glare balefully at Adrian to rescue this particular I, moment train also. I what's am what's Adrian totally gonna say? Happy with what with what I studied. I think okay. you know, I started in nonlinear dynamical systems, you know, and and led during my undergraduate to write my undergraduate thesis. I reduced a, you know, high parameter dynamical system onto a manifold. <laughs> Can you believe? <laughs> and way so ahead that, of your time. That, way ahead of my time, right? So that, that was all incredibly useful. Then statistical physics was also incredibly useful. What I wish I'd taken more seriously in my life, I think the general criticism of the way physics is taught is statistics. <laughs> I, mm. I took one statistics course in my undergrad. I was bored to death. They, tra- they taught it just as, you know, here's the T-test, here's the R-test. I never... Listen, in a vacuum. I, I, they, I did, yeah. yeah, I did cryptic crosswords instead and you know, showed up to the test and it was fine. And so yeah, I would have loved to learn statistics properly. There was one course at the Weizmann where I did my, my um, graduate work on sort of advanced data analysis or just data, it wasn't even advanced, just data analysis, which was sort of enlightening. But we have courses now at UW and ones that Bing teaches, one Nathan Kutz teaches on on how did I not learn about the PCA right, in my physics training? I mean, that's amazing, right? And so I would have loved to do statistics properly in my in my training, and I think that that sets you up very well for be able to use machine learning tools, you know, fluently and to you know integrate them with a physics way of thinking. That's because that's really what I would like to think that my work does. So I'd love to have a deeper deeper training in that in that area. I wish there were sabbaticals during grad school right? Like a year off when you can go do something that is not related to your main thing. I would like to have gone back in time and sold my advisor on that particular scheme, that I'm going to go off to scenic place where let's say Adrian is and, and learn something completely different. And if, if that were the case, I would have wanted to learn something about, you know, Evo Devo stuff, like ecology development, uh, the natural world, mathematical ecology has some gorgeous models. Um, including things that walk a lot like our ducks and uh, quack a lot like our ducks. The tools are very, very similar. Um, and so that's what I would have liked to do more of. It's funny Less you mentioned that because that was, that was my, my entry actually in, into this with mathematical ecology. Oh, wow. I, by high school, I heard a talk from Bob May at this international science school that I attended as an 11th grader. And that, that, excited me and then i got into chaos because of that oh somehow adrian's been doing it right the whole time her entire life just had so much luck <laughs> I, I think i have a better answer now having uh, listened to kanika and adrian's answers um i have i have very few regrets i i really i really like all the things that i've done and the and the path which um i've taken to doing what i'm doing now and i think i think the one thing that um I wish I had better training in like actual formal training is uh, actually I have two different answers that are in totally different direction. One of them is uh, scientific computing. So, so not just the the mathematics, but the actual implementation. Um, Of course, this is a fast evolving field, right? Like every six months, a new, the the cool new tool comes out and you have to keep up, but there's some foundations there. I feel like I never, I never quite had the formal training in it. I had just been kind of trying my best to pick it up as I go along and, and feel always like a little bit behind. Um, yeah. So I wish I had taken more courses than that. And then on the opposite end, I wish I were better trained. Um, I think Kanika mentioned the same thing in developmental and evolutionary biology, um, because it's such a foundational thing about trying to study life. And it's, you know, cause like I mentioned earlier, I think life is not a computer life is life. Right. Um, and so knowing the evolutionary history of life, um, there's such richness of, uh, of, of observations that, that people have from those fields. And I've only recently begun to appreciate it because I happen to sit in an integrative biology department. I have all these colleagues who are paleontologists and, um, 
a developmental biologist, I hear them talk. It's like, oh, why did I, how come I never learned about this? Why did I not know about this? I want to do that, right? Uh, my, my, my secret dream is that, uh, my, my, okay, my, my confession as a biologist is that I've never done a, a, a single hour of field work in my entire life. Hmm. Ideal field work is that I take my laptop to a coffee shop. That's my field work. And so I've been, I've been hinting at all my colleagues that the next time they go out somewhere to collect specimens or something, I don't even care what it is. They need to take me along. <laughs> You should come and collect hydro with us at uh, Woods Hole. I would love to. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, that's good. Even I've done too. <laughs> yeah. Please I'm probably competent it. to do that, hopefully. <laughs> this We've covered a lot of ground, actually, and this has been a lot of fun. Um, do you guys have any, did we, did I leave anything out that you were uh, hoping to talk about or, or that you feel might be words of wisdom to those students who are listening and you know, after this conversation might be even feeling even more overwhelmed because their list just got a lot longer about what they need to learn, et cetera. I, I, would, I would like to pass along a, a piece of advice that I received from my, my undergrad research advisor, Grant Jensen. So, so at the time I was having this conversation with him because I was, I was considering going to grad school. I hadn't even applied yet. And because I was having this like, oh, what do I do? Do I really want to do this? Right. And he told me that, uh, that in one's life, one should strive for, for, for three things. You should pick something that you're good at. You should pick something that, um, that is interesting. And you should pick something that's important for the world. And that most people succeed in getting approximately two out of three. But if you can find something that's three out of three, then that's what you should do. So um, I tried to take his advice seriously. And I've also tried to pass the advice along because I think it's a really good way of not be overwhelmed, right? Because not everyone has to do everything. Because what's interesting to you is not what's interesting to everyone else, what you're good at is not what everyone else is good at. And, and even what you consider to be important for the world, that is a matter of taste, right? What you, what you like. But I think that's, that's been a, um, a piece of advice that's come back to my life over and over. And I just want to pass that along to. Are you, what are you, a two or a three? Mm, on a good day, I think I'm somewhere between a two and a three. Okay. Yeah. Didn't know we could do fractions. I guess the thing I would like to say to mitigate the overwhelmingness, which I understand completely, is that you shouldn't feel starting that you need to know everything and you can do everything. You know, that's certainly not the way my career has gone. You knew how to do a couple of things and built on those both by, you know, opportunistic. Once you realize that your question is taking you in a certain direction, you learn what you need to know kind of around that thing. And of course, as everyone has says, uh, has has emphasized you collaborate and you get great colleagues and great students and great postdocs that can help to augment your your own background and so i think and you know even the point paul that you raised about you know how much of the literature should we go back to obviously you can't have read all the you know that's why we have grace Lindsay right to, to summarize that literature <laughs> for us and and give us a, a path through it and so i i i feel like the main thing is to deeply engage yourself in a question and a problem that excites you have tools that you know where you can make some initial progress and then as you go you can bring in all kinds of other things as you see them you know be open and aware and you know a lifelong learner right that that you need to continue to to keep developing your your toolbox and your you know your set of, of mental analogies let's say so you know that idea that you kind of need to be super highly trained in all areas before you can even make progress is almost the wrong way because sometimes I think you can know too much, right? If you know everything, you can talk yourself out. You know, one of the most brilliant guys in my, in my graduate school group uh, just continually talked himself out of doing anything because he could kind of see five steps ahead and see where it would go around and sort of, no, well, that's not going to work. That's not going to work. And, you know, I think if you, if you're like that, or if you, oh, well, maybe someone did something like that already, you are, you may not just bound into the problem and try something. And then, you know, that's the only way you'll, you'll do original work is to really deeply engage and do. So, you know, you, you anonymously quote uh, one of my, my mentors is, so don't read, do. <laughs> but yeah, I wouldn't go that far, but, you know, there's something, there's something to it. Right? Very good. Connor, could you have any parting thoughts? Uh, well, I want to talk to Bing and Adrienne more. I think what they said, I want to, you know, really kind of, I don't have anything else to add to that. Thank you, guys. This has been really enjoyable. I think it's been a really worthwhile conversation for people. So thanks. Thanks all for having us. Yeah, thanks, Paul. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thanks, Paul. Brain 
Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time. The stair-